Dan Levitard Show with Stu Gotts presents the oldest content in the history of podcasting. Two guests who are a combined 196 years old. Enjoy. Okay. Taco you Wallace. Push it in, right? You push it in. I don't want to shove it in your ear. Okay. Talk to him again, see if he can hear you. Michael Beasley, certified Please. bucket getter. We're getting there, sir. All right. Well, I'm a 94 old man. I can't hear, can't walk. Well, okay. I, well all right. Well, you you look great to me, sir. Look, he is a legend. I want this heard throughout the land, and hopefully, George, you can hear me on this because this can you is hear anything? this is the god of sod. Can you hear? This is the sultan of sod. This is the Sod Father. Hello, Sod Father. Can, the Sod can you hear, Father. Hold on. We got to make sure he hears that He's introduction. Did you hear Father. us? He can hear us. You're smiling. I could hear. Yeah. That's right. That's right. The God Sod Father is here. God That's of right. Sod. God That's of right. Sod. He is God the God of, of Sod. Sod. He is the most universally appreciated groundskeeper in the history of sports. He did it for the Kansas City. He's done every Super Bowl. And we've been wanting to talk to him for a long time. Stugat said he was the get of all gets. I don't know where Stugatz went. He was supposed to be here for this interview. Thank you, George Toma, for it, for being uh, for being you, for being the sod father. Well, what I'd like to do, I would like to take you on a long, long road trip for where I first started and where I ended up today. I started out in a little town of Vettersville, Pennsylvania the heart of the anthracite coal region, right near Wilkesboro, Pennsylvania. And uh, I started there and everybody was poor, the coal miners. And when I was 10 years old, my dad died from anthracylicosis, black lung disease, and had to get a job. In those days, when you were eight years old, you already worked in the mines. and. Uh, Many of those youngsters were killed either by rock slides or by being kicked by the mules for they led the coal cars out of the mule. No way was I going to do that. So I got a job on a vegetable farm, 10 cents an hour, uh, 10, uh, 10 hours a day, six days a week. And then when I was 11, I got a job on a chicken farm and vegetable farm that was uh, 50 cents a day. He gave me lunch, but the farmer taught me so much. I use it today at the Super Bowl. And he was so kind. Every Saturday, he would say, George, kill, kill two chickens and take all the eggs and vegetables that you can carry. So when I was 12, I got a job with my neighbor, who was the head groundkeeper for the Wilkesboro Barons, a Class A Eastern League team, the tough Eastern League back in our area. And it was a farm club for the Cleveland Indians. So I worked with him in 52, 53 and on. And in 1946, Bill, uh, Bill Vick made Stan Shecker the head trainer and bus driver. And me being a senior in high school, he made me the head groundkeeper at 16 years old. And I became the head groundkeeper there for, uh, 1946 and going on and the war was over in 1948 so i went with amo bosley and <laughs> went all to the south building fields for minor league clubs in those days cleveland yankees they probably had 20 some farm clubs george so can i, I uh, george can i stop you for just a second yeah. the only reason i need to stop you is because my producer came in and out of the room while you were talking and he was making oatmeal and he says to me, holy shit, he's only in the 40s. We will get to your story in a second. I want to hear the rest of your story because you're retiring or you have retired at the age of 94 and people need to know what a legend you are and that how uh, this ended is not representative of who George Toma is at the Super Bowl. It's the reason we were calling you, so forgive me for interrupting you while you were talking about serious things like Black Lung, uh, we will get back to that portion of your story. Is that okay? Anything you want to say. 
But what I like to do is just lead you where I started and got me to the first Super Bowl. Okay, we will we will put a bookmark in that. We are going to get back to where it is and how it is you got to the first Super Bowl because you've done every Super Bowl, correct? Right. And you've never had any issues, correct? Like, uh, of course, things pop up, but you have never, in all of your years doing this, you have never had any issues with the field being a problem. Right. And so you arrive at this Super Bowl, and I will ask you this question. Does Roger Goodell care more about how a field looks or how safe it is? Well, I got to go back uh, from Super Bowl one to Super Bowl 39. That was under uh, Pete Rozelle and Paul Tagadblue and the great Jim Steig. And we only had one problem on the field, and that was a game between the 49ers and the Bengals where we covered the field that night and somebody turned the pumps on and sucked the moisture out of the sand. So it was a queasy field. That's the only problem we have. Now from Super Bowl uh, 40 to this Super Bowl here, the 17 years, we had almost maybe a dozen or more problems with an, an unsafe field that I had to correct. And nothing was being done for him. Like the first problem was where our uh, director Fields got caught stealing sod and selling the sod to the NFL. And uh, hey, Katie Corrick and NBC got hold of this and investigated on it, uh, investigated. So the NFL had to go in a hurry and get to Ed Warner, the person that the sod was stolen from and uh, Jennings Turf Farm out of Georgia, get them together to get them and paid off so they can say this is, they paid for their side. But uh, Katie Corrick and uh, NBC had it, so that was it. Then the next big problem came in was, it was Super Bowl 43. Here, Dan Rooney and Coach Tomlin come in from Pittsburgh three days before their to practice. And they met with the NFL officials. And here they said, hey, no way we're going to go on that field. It's unsafe. Get us another practice field. We're not going to be on that field. Then Tomlin says to the NFL official, is George Toma in town? They said, yes. Say so Tomlin said, we like to talk to him because he worked with us in 206 and 207 with the Vikings, and he turned our place around, and it was a great and outstanding and broken a new ground crew. So we got a crew, I call them the F Troop, because I had all rookies, so, and Eddie Mangan kept the good people, or everybody's good at the stadium, and we got that field ready. So uh, Dan Rooney says, I want to talk to George every day, and I want to have him on the practice field every day, and I'll talk to him every day. So I took a few of the people out that day for the first practice. So here I go on the field, and I get field one. Oh, what a beautiful logo painted on the 50-yard line, a big 30-foot logo. Uh, or 10 yard logo of a big large penis and two testicles on the center of the field a big one the artist from them the students at south florida university did a hell of a good job why like i told roger <laughs> that your people are still wet behind the ears you have to have security in a college town at least two weeks before the game, before the practice. And here they didn't have anybody. So we got that out of the way. George, but, what a uh, shocking plot, plot twist. A shocking plot twist in the middle of your story. I, I, I have so many more questions about how you arrived at that field and found that there. I don't, I, I don't want to ask any of them. I can't hear. That's okay. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Okay. And then that was that field there. And then we went on to other fields that were bad. And uh, we had fields 
like uh, they weren't ready. Uh, uh, practice fields don't work ready. And maybe I'd say maybe six times a practice field wasn't ready and the teams come in and they said, we're not going to practice on these fields. They're too dangerous. And two days to three days before their first practice, we had to resod these fields to make them ready. Under the old regime, that would have been done in December or soon as the last college or high school people done. But here they waited too long. And this happened all along. And uh, we had one game that uh, in, Ar in Arizona here that uh, they should have bought the sod in Arizona, that they brought it up from Alabama the price was $100,000 for transportation, and it was bad sod. We had to go in, and I had to go in there and go to Arizona State Bye. and get their overseeing the equipment and overseed it. Eddie Mangan went out there and bought the best fertilizer, the best micronutrients, plus $20,000 of green dye to get that field ready. And that's how it goes. I knew you guys and were painting those fields. It looked too green. That's performance enhancing. Isn't that a, a great disrespect to the 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 honor of landscaping a Super Bowl? What are you accusing him of? I mean, painting the turf is cheating. No. Uh, yeah, that's what they do at Augusta. No. <laughs> no, sometimes you got to do it. Then the next uh, couple years later, we go up to San Francisco. And here it's West Coast turf. And Eddie Mangan hates West Coast turf. He'll do anything. If I know one thing about Eddie Mangan, it's that. <laughs> He's the N he is the NFL's field director. I will tell the people before the, this, uh, yes, tell people more. Excuse me. I, we didn't mean to interrupt you. Okay, so we have West Coast turf now. And with all that green dye and all the nutrients in the fertilizer, he didn't put one drop of fertilizer on that field. He didn't put one drop of microzone in the field. But what he did, he had us put ryegrass seven days to 12 days on the field without working it into the soil. So that ryegrass germinated between the blades of grass and the roots grew together. And that's sabotage because everybody knows in the turf business doing that, that would make that field slippery and slimy. And that's what happened. After the game, the uh, the press and the TV came to me and asked me what. And I should kick myself in the fan because I lied. I protected Eddie Mangan and said, well, the weather was this. I protected the NFL and said the weather was this and this and that. But I should have told the truth. But one man that was pissed off and really pissed off was Ned York, the owner of the San Francisco, I mean, yeah, of uh, Niners, the 49ers. Yeah. Yeah. That game was played on his field and so sloppy and slimy and everything. He contacted Dr. Uh, McNitt, the professor of turf at Penn State University, and had Doc investigated for sabotage. So and you were, you were what the. Ed did, what Ed did, he put that seed in there, you know, when it ruined the field. So this is actually and, uh, a huge revelation right now because you were the fall guy. The sod father was the fall guy yeah. for everyone slipping and the Eagles' historic pass rush slipping and sliding all over the place. You were playing ball, and now you're singing like a canary, sod father. Well, they hit me pretty hard, but that's it. But being uh, 94 years old, and 81 years in this game, and having so many groundskeepers. These NFL groundskeepers at this game got thrown under the bus. And let me say one thing here. Travis Hogan, the groundskeeper for the Kansas City Chiefs, in my 81 years, I never seen a better groundskeeper in my life than Eddie, than Travis. I never seen, I never stood on better grass than I stood on Arrowhead Stadium. 
And Monday before the game, January of February 6th, he told me that there's a bad smell on this field. It's stinking. He told me that this grass is decaying. It's bad. And then uh, Andy Levy, the groundskeeper for the Cardinals, told me, hey, this grass is rotting. It stinks. What happened? I'll have to take a step backwards. The year before that, the Bengals at uh, California, UCLA, couldn't, we told Eddie Mang and everybody that that field's not ready. It's in bad shape. He wouldn't listen there. After the first practice, they could, the Bengals couldn't practice. They were in the huddle, and I went out to talk, talk to Coach there. I said, Coach, do you have a problem? And I'm very close with the Bengals because Paul Brown loves me and Mike Brown. You can ask Mike Brown how Paul Brown loved me. And I says, Coach, what's your problem? He says, we can't practice on this field tomorrow. We can't. It's wet and slippery. My men are falling. I'm afraid somebody's going to get hurt. I have to go to the artificial turf field at UCLA. I don't want to oh, go there. I hate that. Wait, UCLA? UCLA use artificial says, turf? Coach, don't move. Wait, the Rose Bowl Stay uses artificial coach, turf? Coach. I ran and got Travis Hogan. Oh, he lost his earpiece. The, <laughs> NFL the Rose penalties. Bowl. The, wait, says, the Rose Bowl? I brought him to the coach. <laughs> Does the Rose says, Coach, tell these gentlemen the what The Rose Bowl. He said, gentlemen, I can't practice on this <laughs> field. Did you say this field is slippery, wet? We're fine. I we, can't. We can't stop him. Did you say the Rose Bowl? We can't go stop on the him. Artificial turf field, but I don't want to go on that artificial turf field. I can't. I the says, Rose Bowl is artificial. Coach, George, hold on a second. I'll I need to you, stop you. I'll say something, George. I'm 93 years old. <laughs> we established I've been that. In this game, 80 years, and I've been had experience going all the way around the world. Even building in a little field for the kibbutz in Israel and having little children helping. And I, a lot of experience. And here is Travis Hogan, the greatest groundkeeper that ever lived. Nobody I've seen in my 81 years can, 80 years can. Even better than Trevor shirt. Vance? Nobody. And here's Andy Levy, the great groundskeeper, the father of the house at the the stadium in Phoenix. Top five groundskeepers? With their experience and my experience, we will have that field ready for you tomorrow. And we did. And we had it in good shape for them Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. After Saturday's practice, the coaches came up and hugged me and thanked me. I said, I don't deserve this. This goes back to the ground crew, Travis and his crew. But where was the people from the NFL to thank our ground crew to save their family? Nobody, nobody at all. And sometimes I would tell when uh, uh, Troy Vinson had his first uh, problem out at the Canton, Ohio, uh, at the Pro Bowl, they canceled it. He says, this, I'm new at this, but this will never happen again. If Jim Steig was there, it wouldn't happen. If I was there, t I could take Eddie Mangan and uh, Javier Exer from... I'm done with this Eddie uh, Mangan. Uh, uh, these are shocking Turkey. allegations. He's throwing or everyone he under the bus. They canceled that game in Mexico. We have shocking... I told Roger Goodell, <laughs> maybe you should send your men... To Washington, his, his earpiece fell out. I know he can't hear Senator me. Senator Dianne Feinstein, she can maybe help you. Because Senator Dianne Feinstein, me, we turned the mic around a, like a, for two piece. playoff games in San Francisco. And that's hitting below the belt. But we had maybe 12 out of 17 <laughs> games the fields were in unsafe. This is a piece of and art. This was one of them. I have no way to tell. But Can you put your. What Eddie Mangan did to that bango field, he did the same thing to the game field here. And and we're getting the blame. So it's Eddie Mangan's fault. You, before we took the field into the stadium for good, that was Wednesday before the game. He watered the field heavy before it went in. 
And if he talked to Andy Levy, you water that field at eight, nine in the morning, then take it in then. He watered and put it right in, soaking wet. And then at four o'clock that afternoon, we had to put a field cover down because of rehearsals. So we use an ink mat that is a material that they use to cover grass for concerts and geotextile, which is like heavy woolen blankets, plus a large field cover of rain tarp with the football field painted on them for so they can hurt. And those football lines on that tarp have to be exactly on those football lines on the field, be setting up for Sunday's game. So, so after practice, we take the field cover off and take everything off. And where they came up the ramp on the field, uh, uh, area 30 feet wide by 100 feet long, the grass was mashed. If somebody took a tamp and hit it, and there was mud all over the grass, wet, it was saturated. And they had a couple more practices. But... What happened there? How Eddie screwed up that field for the Bengals by overwatering it, and he did the same thing here. All right, and so it's Eddie Mangan's fault. It's All Eddie Mangan's I'm asking fault. is Eddie and the NFL to come out and Eddie to say, "Yes, I overwatered. I'm responsible for it. not." putting the blame on me and putting the blame on Travis Hogan and Andy Lee, the leaders of the NFL ground crew. They're are all these groundkeepers third are going back to their hometown. They're getting ridiculed. The, there's a Heather's a bony, the head groundkeeper for the Detroit Tigers and her assistant. This was her 18th Super Bowl. And she's going back there and those baseball with groundkeepers are on her fanny. And all these groundskeepers going out, they're on your family. And yes, Mr. Magan, don't lie. In your interviews with Phil Bogle, you lied. You blame the ryegrass for the cause of that disaster. Bullshit. Whoa! Whoa. I have used ryegrass for 27 years, and it wasn't any problem. And those first 27 years of using ryegrass, I only spent a thousand dollars on the field. Now we're spending eight hundred, seven to eight hundred thousand dollars, and give the players the horseshit field. That's bullshit. Wow. And I'm just, I'm, I'm mad about it. Yeah, yeah, I can tell. And what Eddie did out at the Bengals, he over overwatered it. it. And now he's blaming the ryegrass. Well, Eddie, you overwatered the Bermuda. He did. So are you blaming the Bermuda grass for the bad field out there? No, overwatering. I, all I'm asking. I hate Eddie, Eddie Mangan. And all the NFL officials, Roger, and people down there, Can, is to please sir, apo not to apologize to me. Sir? I'm over the hill, like I tell my ground crew. Sir? Next year, I'll probably, the Lord may put me in heaven, and I'll be looking down at your beautiful field. Oh, he'll put me in hell, and I'll be looking up at your root system. What kind of root <laughs> system? <laughs> Yo, Sodfather has oh, bars. He's a better angle. He has bars. all you want. <laughs> but apologize to the people that put you there and helped you. And kick yourself in the ass for not listening to somebody we, like we, we've graduated Travis from Fanny. Hogan and Andy Levy. Uh, and sir, can you hear us? And to Troy Help. Vincent. Troy, with all these problems that we had for 17 years. We get his headphones and in. And feels two days, three days, about a half a dozen times. You never came to me and asked me what the problem was. If you were any type of good guy worrying about the NFL players, you should have came to talk to me. I'll take a step back. Last uh, January, we had a convention, the Sports Field Managers Convention, 
in Salt Lake City. Sounds like a party. And <laughs> Travis Smith, Maurice Smith, the head of the Players Union with the keynote speaker. After he spoke, I spoke. And he said, gentlemen, I apologize to everyone here because I failed to give the NFL players a safe playing field. I said, for 71 years, I've been preaching the safest insurance for an athlete from preschool to the professional level, the chief is the safe playing field. And I failed. And I gave him an example. A few years back at the Dolphins, the groundkeeper there, uh, the I got him Bermuda the job grass. there with Cookie Rojas. Whoa. And he went astray. He went <laughs> I get this a, reference. And Name he that makes you smile. Three times in one month, in, in four weeks. I said to Maurice Smith, where was your union to go in there and see what the problem is? Giving the players the bad field for three weeks? Where was the NFL? Where was Troy Vincent? Where were the owners? Where was the coaches? And Eddie Mangum. Where were they? Nobody, but I said this. You put your headphones back in, sir? I'm ready for heaven or hell. What? But before I go there, I would like to meet with the players. And I, I put my life for the players. I would like to meet with the players' union, the NFL, the owners, the owners, you're getting screwed. You're not getting a safe thing for you. The owners, the coaches, and yes, maybe a representative from the NCAA because some of these stadiums are team. And me to talk to them and tell them about all these problems that Roger Goodell and Troy Vincent are overlooking. And that's the only way that we're going to give the players a safe playing field. Could, could, That's the only way. Could that, Travis, I mean, Troy Vincent headphones. never came to me or anybody <laughs> on the ground crew. Can we get your headphones? To up? see. <laughs> like the Rebels that I work with down south on field, they like, would say to Trav, uh, Troy oh, Vincent, you. <laughs> you're as useless as a pair of tits on the boar hog. Oh, no. That's what they oh, would no. Tell okay. Him. I mean, the Rebels thing, I didn't know where that was going either. Hold on you a have second. To come back. And Roger Goodell, I have done everything for you. You treated me well. When I was with the Vikings, every time you came to the Vikings, you came down to the practice field to hug me. When I was, you come down, if I was in the indoor field, you found me. At the Super Bowls, you found me. And then when I was 90 years old, you gave me a, a game ball. For my 90th birthday, no then you gave me a game ball when the, uh, when Brady won. That was when Brady won, and then you gave me a game ball when the Chiefs won. Then you gave me a game ball last year, and you did good things. And you're gonna be a hero with me and the Toro Grass Corporate Corporation. We have the Sports Field Manager Association convention every year. And the Toro and my wife are going to uh, set up three boots. And boots. we're going to put uh, each one of these footballs in each boot. And uh, a member can come up and hold that football as he's passing, catching it, and have a picture taken for maybe $5. Or ten dollars. Okay. And that's three football. I think seven. And that money will go to our I like the seven's the right price point. Manners Association's safe S A P. That we have. There we safe. go. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. sir. We got yes. the other. We got the other. Can you hear us? Safe. Thank you. Can hold, you hear us? Right. Hold Boy, on. Finish safe to raise money for safe playing fields. Okay, go ahead. You can hear us now? George, thank you. you. Oh, okay, right. yeah, George. Thank you. Thank, was that your wife that helped you with uh, that uh, that headphone that popped out there? I'm set now. Okay. Uh, uh, George, I, I, you didn't finish your thought on Roger Goodell. We've been trying to talk to you because you were, you were saying he's been very kind to you. Yes, but uh, last year he threw me over the cliff. I wrote a letter to him because I was pissed off because of that incident for the 
Bengals not having the practice field. Where was the NFL to give them a safe practice field? We had to go in there. So I wrote them a letter that I was pissed. This is my last year was Super Bowl last year. And I gave him some thoughts. I said, you have to get Troy Vincent and get Troy to do a better job. What he preached when he messed up in Canton in Mexico, what he preached, he has to practice and he's not doing that. He has to do a better job. Phil Bogle, the man under him, has to get out of the stadiums and go to the practice fields and check the practice. And God bless you because Phil Bogle visited practice fields this year. So you had all of that. And and with Eddie Mangan, not listen, we he sabotaged the field. And we had a side fields two to three times before the first day. George, First George, game. you're you're accusing the NFL's field director of sabotaging the field. Why and how? I mean, you've told us how. Why did he sabotage the field? Well, that one there, we I think, is only a West Coast turf sod. And, and when I'm saying sabotaging, that's a term that groundkeepers use when they do something wrong, yeah. like putting that seed in without working. It goes it. beyond just groundskeeping. And, and then Ned York having an investigated. He's a hell of a good groundkeeper when he was under me. But I'll go back a step. When he took over, he went astray. Six years ago, the NFL groundkeepers came to me and pleaded with me to go to the league and ask the league why that these groundskeepers have to have a good playing field for 16 games and the NFL can have a good playing field for one Super Bowl game. They wanted Eddie fired. And then that same year, I'm sorry, Eddie, but you deserve it. You got to be a better man. My love. But that same year or around that year, the the Atlanta Braves players took him to the players union. The first time in the history of the players union that a groundskeeper was taken to the union for bad grass and bad dirt. And I talked to Eddie about this this year, that you got to do a better job. I said, Eddie, those NFL groundkeepers over there are laughing at you. They're on their videos and watching you busting your fanny, top it, it, fixing the pitching mound, when they stopped the game this year in the second playoff game for you to fix the pitching mound, and you're busting your fanny, and they're laughing at you. I said, you got to cuddle up to those guys and listen to those guys. I mean, not ignore them. Sounds like an but, actual turf war. George, George, you sound embarrassed and you sound angry. This is not the way for your career to end. Well, it sounds like all fingers are being pointed at Eddie Mangan here, and you were the fall guy, and you once saved his job once, and he's not reciprocating the great— I still say, this year we knew there were problems. Like at the convention, McNitt and I knew there was going to be problems. And we knew there were problems. We already with Phil Bogle and— and uh, uh, Travis Hogan uh, has plans for next year already, is to have Matt Griner grow the sod. He's the groundkeeper for uh, the 49ers. Have West Coast first, uh, but have Griner go in there once or twice a week to look at it. And then bring up maybe Nick, uh, Nick under Bogle to look out the field. And whoever, when Ed, I always recommended, when Eddie went to look at a West Coast field, he should take Mike Albino, a heck of a good turf man from Beacon Construction Company in Syracuse, or Will Schnell, the retired groundkeeper from the Rose Bowl along. Cause he, this year, Eddie never went out. Phil Bogle had a young. Phil's a shirt, uh, uh, a tie, a shirt and tie guy. He should have taken on one trip Mike Albino 
And on the second trip, Will Snell to look at this. You're dropping some and pretty I big names. Don't, don't apologize to me, partner. I'll say this. Eddie, you're making over $100,000 a year. Your wife is an attractive salary. And I'm doing this for the last 17 years. Roger Goodell is paying me $15 an hour for se- average for $17. And thanks for giving Roger, our ground crew, a raise, Arlene. Travis Hogan is making now $18 an hour. And I get on Travis Hogan's fanny. Here I have 57 Super Bowls and they're paying me $15 an hour. You only have six Super Bowls and you're getting 18. But let me tell you all something. I'm for safety to feel my grandmother taught me to help. I would do this job for nothing because I love what I'm doing. And I'll fight anybody and all the way up to you, Mr. Goodell, to give the players the safe playing field that you're not doing. And trick the lies and trick the bullshit. That's what you got to do. I'm over the hill. But please, Daddy, and please, Roger, and... Uh, Vincent, apologize to all our ground crews and to the nation. (laughs) Their new book, Wake Up With Purpose, What I've Learned in My First Hundred Years, is going to be released uh, next week, uh, very soon, February 28th. Uh, Seth Davis is with us here. Sister Jean is here. She uh, She's an inspiration. I don't know. We'll get to Seth in a second, but please tell us, sister, before we go any further, I, I'm sure people ask you a version of this question all the time. What is the secret to getting to a happy and healthy 103 years old? Well, when people ask me that question, I say I eat well, I sleep well, and hopefully I pray well. But the DNA has to come in there, too, because my dad lived to be 95, and he had sisters and brothers who also went, oh, left us between 90 and 95. So when I became 95, I thought to myself, well, God will be calling me any day now, but here I am at 103 and still going. Seth, I'm sorry, go ahead. Part of it is because I am had a very happy childhood. I love, have a lot of fun in life. I enjoy talking to people, enjoy listening to people. And I just have a good time. What I try to do at night is go to bed happy, so I'll wake up happy in the morning. Seth, why did you decide you could have done any number of college football book or college basketball books? What drew you to this subject matter, and what did you learn in doing that uh, in doing this that you didn't know before you started? Well, I, you know, I met Sister Jean and obviously chronicled, chronicled her participation in Loyola's um, trip to the Final Four. And you know, as someone who was very close, I was very fortunate and blessed to have all four grandparents um, well into my 20s. And I was very close with all of them, played golf with all of them, um, and was close to my my grandmothers. And I just remember during that run to the Final Four, thinking about how lucky those players were, and all those students at Loyola were, that they had this incredible person, this beautiful older woman who was mentally sharp uh, and very active and very much in their lives, just to be around and, and to be around her spirit, her knowledge, her wisdom. And it certainly occurred to me that, boy, I'll bet she's got a great book in her. That's just how I'm trained to think. I, I have a hundred ideas for books uh, that I, I don't have the time. Um, and then I sort of kept tabs on her through Porter Moser, who was the former coach at Loyola and now moved on to Oklahoma. And I, like everybody else who sees Porter, yeah, 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 how are you doing? But how Sister Jean, you know? And so Porter told me, I remember vividly standing with him at a AU term at the Peach Jam in, in Georgia. I asked her about Sister Jean. He had just taken the job at Oklahoma and he told me, that Sister Jean, as a going away present, printed up all or most of the emails she had ever sent to him uh, and to the team, pr- actually had them printed up, uh, bound into a book and gave it to him as a as a going away present. Um, and it just was just one more data point for me that said, boy, this this woman is an amazing and I've just had this bug in my head that it just won't leave me. Can you put me in touch with her? And uh, he did. 
Um, and like uh, a lot of beautiful women that I've talked to over my life, she rejected me uh, 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 initially. <laughs> and uh, I guess I, I either wore her down or wild her with my my charm. And um, we, we, we kind of got off and running. I, I will say that I didn't know what the book was going to be about. I didn't know what the title of the book was going to be, but I always had in mind the subtitle, which is what I've learned during my first hundred years. I just knew that was a subtitle. And then I, I believe I, I mentioned that to her in our first conversation. And and from there, we were off and running. Sister, why did you reject his initial offers? Uh, well, during the final four or and after, there were about six other fellas called me from different places and said, oh, Sister Jean, um, I'd like to write a book with you. And I said, I don't have time to write a book. I have too much to do. You know, don't, please, no, don't. I can't do that. So I rejected six people. And then Seth got in touch with me. And I, I, I don't know. It's just like when you meet somebody, you know, and you say, yeah, well, I'll do that. But I didn't say yes right away. I told them I had to, I wanted to check with my congregation and with my employer, Loyola. And so I did that, and they said, go for it, Sister Jean. So called them. Yep, we went for it. And here we are now ready to, I'm ready to autograph the books. They'll be re they are ready to go. Opportunists and snakes uh, surrounding her. She finally, <laughs> she thought that Seth was the least uh, opportunist and the least snake from among those people. You should know, though, Sister Jean, that I believe what we have in our company is uh, the single greatest adversary that you have anywhere in the United States. Uh, Stu Gotts mm -hmm. uh, loves you. You're a decent woman. Everyone loves you. Uh, but he also has something that he's been espousing around here for a couple of years that he thinks that you will agree with. I want to do this the right way, and I want to do this and ask this respectfully, okay? But Sister okay. Jean, so don't you think, don't you feel like the media and people like Seth Davis gave you a little too much credit for Loyola making it to the Final Four? The kids are out there playing. You know that, <laughs> Sister Jean, right? Yeah. Uh, oh, I don't think they made too much of it oh. because – Everybody Jesus. made a lot of it. And right. so they would have been out of sync if they didn't make a lot. <laughs> and right. because even when we uh, came back to Chicago, we were met by a, a police escort at the airport. And they gave that escort to us all the way back to Loyola. We had um, so many reporters at uh, Loyola that they were waiting in the atrium for us. And that that really startled me. And they took, well, somebody took the very the two best players and took them to the press room and interrogated them. But then the other reporters just kept taking the other young men. And so every 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 young man had his own reporter. And they told me, they said, you know, your kids really know how to talk, Sister Jean. They could answer the questions and everything. So I shared that with some of the faculty because the faculty had to see them more sometimes than their families do. And so I said, you know, they said to me, well, you know, they really know how to talk. And I said, that's, that's really what you help them do when they go in class and you has, ask to get have them give reports or whatever. And so I said, we're really proud of them, the way they can do that and do it very very maturely. That's awesome. I think, she, That's I think she just dumped on you. No, 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 she didn't. I, but, no, but, no, 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 no. No, Jean, yeah. you, do, you, okay. you, you do great work, and that's a great story. But I'm asking, do you actually feel like anything oh, you did? Oh, you're going to double down? You're going to double down on it's this? It's a fair I, question. I respect this. I respect no, no, no. This. no great, it's a fair it's question. It's a great question. Thank exactly you, Seth. It's a great question. I appreciate Seth, it. you cannot have an argumentative interview with no, Sister Jean. I'm, I'm <laughs> certain Sister Jean would want all the credit to go to the kids and not to Sister Jean. That's all I'm asking, Sister Jean. <laughs> Don't you think more of the credit should have went to no, the kids? Sister Jean is responsible for these miracle runs. Oh, what has happened with Jessica and Billy? Billy, what's going on there back there with you guys? What's happening? Nothing. This is going great. Yes. Yeah. Sister Jean, I love you, just so you know, okay? And, and Seth, thank you, also, because I need your credibility. Uh, Sister this Jean, is a fair question. you should understand okay. that uh, his <laughs> I love you, his words mean nothing.
Yeah. <laughs> He's right about you know, that. The, the, you know, God, the, there's a, a famous quote, I believe, from Albert Einstein that says, uh, coincidence is God's way of staying anonymous. Uh, One of uh, my favorites. <laughs> just, 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 putting, just putting it out there. And then I would encourage you to go and rewatch uh, the win over Tennessee, uh, Clayton Custer's game-winning shot, and explain to me how that ball defied all uh, laws of physics, uh, Albert Einstein's area of expertise, to go in. So right. I'm just saying, who's to say, right? Sister, uh, have have you read the book? Have you yet read the book? Oh, a couple of times. She wrote and, it. And what did you like about your own book? Again, the name is Wake Up With Purpose, what I've learned in my first hundred years. But as you read uh, Seth putting together your life in a form that can be remembered and learned from, what did you like about the book? Well, I think that Seth actually captured who I am and what I did and how much I loved what I did. I, and I, as I read it, I could figure, I could just see myself the way I was from the time I was two and a half until I was 103. And so I think he captured everything. I also say he worked me hard, but gently. Uh, he, he got, and that, 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 that goes together, you know, that can go together in the question. And when, when somebody keeps pushing and gets the answer, he or she really thinks is the right answer. And so I think he got the right answers from me every time he asked me a question. Seth, when you're asking through the reporting, because you do have to be diligent about covering all of the terrain in someone's life, what were the areas that were most inspirational to you, where you did the most uh, uh, learning or you thought you had the richest material for your book? Well, you've got to appreciate what it's like to work with someone who is, you know, 100, I guess, Sister Jean, maybe 102 when we started, who has, I don't know if it's a, I'd call it a photographic memory, but a very specific memory. Like when she talks about from two and a half, she's not exaggerating. The book opens with a story about her being at her grandmother's funeral and about how her uh, infant brother uh, was sick and they were concerned about the health of her infant brother. And then they, they they bury her her grandma and the infant brother gets better and her mom says to her you see grandma made made our made, made him better you know and so telling stories about how she and her mom walked across the Golden Gate Bridge on the day that it opened because she grew up in the Bay Area so just the the specificity of her recollections I couldn't I couldn't probe her enough and and come up with something she didn't recall with great specificity names dates. Um, and so that just gave me, uh, as a writer, incredibly rich material. But th this question kind of goes back to your original one as well, because I get asked the same thing. Like, I mean, how, like, how is this possible? DNA, you know, the blessings from above, all of it go into it. But I'll, I'll tell you what my one of my main takeaways is, and that's the the energizing, life-giving power of work. Look at her right now. You know where she is, guys? She's in her office at Loyola, it's in the ground floor of the student section, uh, the student uh, center of, of the university. I, I, I've sat with her in that room. Kids are coming in and out. There's a cafeteria right down the hallway. Uh, uh, Tom Hitcho, her, her caretaker or whoever's with her, wheels are down. She, she is constantly uh, writing, talking to people, meeting with people. She's in, involved in meetings. She still emails me a couple of days a week, which is just, just a manna from heaven. Um, she works and she works all day. And then she's, you know, praying for the team. She's doing scouting. Like she, it's not enough for her to just pray for the team. She researches their opponents so she can email this information and, and bring some 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 help there. So j just her work ethic and how competitive she is and her drive. I mean, she comes across as a sweet little old lady and she certainly is. But believe me, she works hard. She works with intentionality. She works with purpose. And I think it's it's it's. It's done a lot. Uh, it goes a lot towards explaining why she's in such amazing shape, you know, physically and mentally at the age of 103. Sister Jean, how come you've never sent these prayers the way of my alma mater, Notre Dame? We are also a Catholic <laughs> school in the Chicagoland area. We could use some of the, our, our team hasn't made a final four in a while in men's basketball. Oh, I, I, I wasn't invited yet. <laughs> I'm inviting you to pray for the Notre Dame men's basketball and program. the Jets and the Jets while you're at it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, there's only so much miracles that can happen. When we're talking about the Jets. <laughs> oh yes, it. Well, well, we played Notre Dame maybe 
a couple of years ago when Porter was, um, and we all, we started out by doing very well in that game. And later on, one of your um, players told one of our players, we were really scared that you were going to beat us. Because of you, Sister Jean, probably. <laughs> I, I know. I know. Well, when we played Harvard, the Harvard coach played that I wouldn't come to the game. Wow. And so he, could, he said, I don't think I want Sister Jean here. I mean, he said that facetiously, <laughs> I hope. Gene, do prayers stop working at the Final Four? Oh, no. What? What? No. What happened there? No. I'm just saying. Michigan. Michigan. <laughs> Michigan. <laughs> Michigan. Michigan. Of course. And that is terrible. It's like, it's like watching. She laughs. Really. She's smiling. <laughs> it's unfair. Gene loves me. Come yeah. on. There's no God in Michigan, Stu God. Well, you know what? Um, Michigan had a, a grandmother who was... Uh. Boosting theirs. I don't oh. recall her name. It was, uh, it was Jalen Rose's grandma. Oh, and, and uh, she, uh, excuse me, Jalen, Jalen Rose's mother. Yeah. Oh, okay. And so she she kept she sent me an email saying, "You're at the end of the line, Sister Jean." Oh no! Oh, wow. What is that? Something, something to that effect. Talking smack. That is terrible trash talk. Put it on the poll, please. At Levitard but show. That, that's a, okay. She. she she said uh, Michigan's going to win the game. Are the prayers of Jalen Rose's mother more powerful than the <laughs> prayers of Sister Jean at Levitard Show? Over the last hundred years, Sister Jean, when you look, I, I, I imagine there are all sorts of things about advancements in the country, in the world, uh, that are confounding to you. I'm 54, and I'm getting confounded all the time these days. What has uh, what has changed most since you were a, a young woman or in your teens about the country, and uh, what are the changes that you like or don't like uh, over the last 100 years, if you have memories dating back to when you're two and a half years old? Well, uh, f first of all, um, digital media and all the and things that we have going on in um, newspapers and to, uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all those things, those words were in, in, even in our conversation. And all of a sudden, everything kind of pops out and moves quickly. And everything is moving, perhaps, maybe 50% faster than it did before. We know news almost before it happens now, whereas before we used to have to wait till the newsboy came down the street and said, extra, extra, all about it, read all about it. And my dad gave us two pennies to go out to the street to pick up the paper in San Francisco to tell us the news that already happened maybe a day ago. They still gave us some, but they weren't updated. That whole, the whole news area is different, and the people's attitude toward it is different. And everybody wants to do have news before it happened. Everybody, the, and I noticed that these young people want everything to happen the day before it does, or they want everything instantly. They come in and say, Sister Jean, I have a, I have a, an assignment in class. I'm supposed I'm supposed to um, uh, interview somebody older and find out. And I said, well, what do you have to find out? Well, the changes you've seen in communication. I said, how do, how long do you think this will take? Oh, about fifteen minutes. I said, <laughs> how could I possibly tell all the changes I've seen in fifteen minutes? When even if I talked for one minute for each year I lived, we'd be late for dinner. <laughs> I said, we're going to have this set aside at least one hour. And then I can go back and talk about newspapers and typewriters and all kinds of telephones and so forth. So it does take us an hour. What what they, concerns you most about today, and what is a thing that you long for uh, from ninety years ago that that you think we're missing because we're moving too fast? 
Well, in some cases, we're moving too slowly. In some places, we're moving too too fast. Uh, let me talk about the slowly part. I think that we're taking our time to get peace. And we're taking our time to get settled with different cultures. We're taking our time, even though we're even though we're trying to do things perhaps that we've never done before in helping people, we're we're very slow. I I think that what I've seen happen the fastest in that is the situation of the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria. This is one thing where I've noticed the whole world is participating and helping these poor people try to stay alive, to find the people who are still alive and to take care of those who are injured. And then they had the second earthquake and then lost they lost more. Everybody wants to help them. And that is a great move forward. It's bringing the cultures together. So I hope it keeps going forward. What would I like to see happen? I'd like to see more peace. Uh, I'd like to see more um, perhaps communications among certain groups that really don't use communications correctly. And I'd also like to see these young people that we're educating today, I tell them they are the future leaders of the church, whatever church they belong to. They're the future leaders of society and they're future leaders of the world. So they better get their lives together, be strong enough to speak up, speak the truth, speak the ethical parts of what they've learned and to move forward to be leaders. In fact, we have one student who graduated five years ago and cur currently he won the election in Phoenix, Arizona to be a representative in the state. 20, 25, that's pretty good, I think. So if we have people who go ahead and do all that, there are others from all the universities that could do be leaders, political leaders, social leaders, whatever kind we need. That's what I'd like to see, more cooperation in doing things like that. Wake up. I'd, I'd like to see the students uh, who have think that they don't need God right now. I'd like to think, and I do tell parents that they'll come back, they'll need God, and they'll all come back to their churches. I'm a firm believer. The name of the book, Wake Up With Purpose, What I've Learned in My First Hundred Years. It's going to be released here February 28th. She wrote it uh, with Seth Davis. What do you have here, Jessica, to close this out with Sister Jean? Sister Jean, uh, did you give up anything for Lent this year? Wow. Say that again. Did you give up anything for Lent this year? Well, you no, know, somebody asked me that early this morning. And I said, well, so far, I'm... I haven't done that. I haven't thought about that because the church keeps us pretty much in, in line in what we're doing. But rather than uh, giving up, I decided to increase what I was reading. So I, I'm going to set a time each day to to do more reading about my faith. And I have some uh, a book that one of my students wrote a student I wrote, um, uh, taught in eighth grade. So, and he sent me an autographed book. Of, and so I'll, I'll read that. I'll begin to read that. Um, the other thing I want to do is to be very positive about life. I am positive, but I need maybe to show that even a little bit more. I want to teach more people to be happy. And I think when they read my book, they'll find out there are a couple of ways you can be happy. So I, it's more positive things that I want to do. And I just want to tell you a little secret. When I taught eighth grade for years, we never made resolutions for the whole of Lent because 
40 days is a long time. It is a long time. Long time to stay it, off TikTok. It, it, it right? is a long oh, time. Yeah. She is not positive enough, yep. uh, uh, and she makes no sacrifices for Lent. I think we've concluded Sister Jean <laughs> overrated as a spiritual I and, do it in the final four, and, and I mean, decent yeah. figure. Hasn't won enough, and also her prayers don't work as well as Jalen Rose's mom's uh, prayers. <laughs> Wake up with You're purpose. You're laughing at me, Jean. <laughs> what I've learned in my first hundred years. Uh, Seth, some final thoughts here on behalf of how much you admire this woman and why you admire this woman. A book is a painstaking uh, effort and for you to pour your uh, life into this for many months because you wanted to tell her story. I think people need to hear why it is that you believe in her this way. Well, I, I think you all are, as I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm first of all, thank you for having us. Um, and you're sitting here listening to her. I, I'm sure you're as, as amazed as, as I was listening to her. Um, and so, yeah, books, t they, they take a lot of time, but this one was, was pure joy. And I mean, the purest joy. And so, um, as much as I admire her life and all that she's done and all that she says and all that she represents, you know what I'm most grateful for? I made a really good friend and I consider her a friend. And I'm just lucky to have her in, in my life. And so I thank you guys for, for giving her this platform so that her words can reach a greater audience than, than just inconsequential me. Uh, congratulations, guys. Happy for you. And uh, Stugatz, I hope uh, uh, you have lightened up on, on your nemesis some after just being charmed by her. We'll uh, pray for you, Stu. Yeah, I mean, tough year, though, this year, Gene. So just pray a little bit more. I think they're 9 and 17, you know? <laughs> oh, no. What I'm, happened I'll there? Do, I'll, I'll do my very best to pray for all you guys, too. Thank you. I need it. Yes, <laughs> does need I need it. it. I'm so sorry. I love you so much. I really do. The words mean nothing. Thank you, Sister Jean. We appreciate it. Thank you, Seth. Uh, you've done enough blaspheming against Jesus this segment. Please stop doing that. You're right. Thank you.